food. It's something we all need, we all love, and we all have our unique tastes in. But have you ever wondered how our ancestors dined? Not the generations before us who enjoyed a similar diet to ours, but going back even further, centuries ago, millennia even. Were they munching on the same kind of stuff we enjoy now, or were their palates attuned to tastes that might make us squirm? Well, hold on to your lunch, because we're about to embark on a culinary journey back in time to discover some of the, let's say, more unusual diets from history. Are you ready to chew on some historical food facts that could leave you feeling a little queasy? Let's dig in. Garum, a fermented fish sauce, was a staple in ancient Roman cuisine and dates back to the 4th century BC. The Romans were quite adventurous eaters, and this sauce was highly esteemed and often used as a topping for various dishes. It was made from the intestines of fish and various other parts that would otherwise be discarded. These were fermented in the sun for several weeks to a few months, resulting in a pungent, intensely fishy and salty condiment. Despite the somewhat unappealing preparation process, it was considered a luxury item with the best quality garum fetching high prices. Another Roman delicacy that may seem unusual to us today was a dish called Isisia Aumentata. This was essentially a fancy Roman hamburger made from minced meat, pepper, soaked bread and wine-soaked breadcrumbs, all mixed into a patty. Sounds pretty standard so far, right? However, one of the primary ingredients was ground-up earthworms, which the Romans believed were an excellent source of protein and added a unique texture to the dish. Earthworms were typically harvested after a heavy rain, washed to remove the dirt, and then ground into a paste to be mixed into the meat. This dish was popular among the upper classes in Roman society during the 1st to 4th centuries AD. So, while garum and Isisia omentata might not be on the menu at your local restaurant, they offer a fascinating glimpse into the eating habits of one of history's most influential civilizations. These unique dishes underline the fact that what we consider gross or delicious is largely a matter of cultural perspective. In the opulent feasts of ancient Rome, alongside delicacies such as peacock tongues and sea urchins, one might have found a rather unusual dish, stuffed dormice. Yes, you heard that right. This particular rodent was a gourmet delicacy during the Roman Empire, primarily around the 1st century AD. The Romans would farm these rodents, fatten them up with a diet of walnuts, acorns and chestnuts, and then stuff them with a mixture of pork and a variety of spices before roasting or boiling them. But the Romans' unique taste didn't stop at dormice. Another odd delicacy that might have been on their menu was a dish known as satyra. Satyra was a mixed dish often consisting of various ingredients such as brain-filled sausages, honeyed wine-soaked bread, and sometimes even flamingo. Talk about a dinner to remember. This eclectic concoction illustrates the Romans' love for extravagant and diverse flavors, a trait that made their feasts famous throughout history. The ancient civilization of Cyrene, modern-day Libya, gave the world a plant so valuable, it was literally worth its weight in gold. The Silphium plant, now believed to be extinct, was used extensively in cooking, medicine, and even as a form of birth control from about 700 BC until it disappeared around the 1st century AD. Its resin was used to flavor food and was reportedly so delicious that it was in high demand throughout the Mediterranean. The plant's perceived value was so great that Cyrenian coins bore its image. But while the Cyrenians had a taste for the finer things, they were not averse to some less than appetizing culinary habits. A particularly noteworthy dish that they were known to enjoy was sea urchin. These spiny sea creatures were often cracked open and eaten raw guts and all. To the Cyrenians, the taste was incomparable, but to our modern palates, the thought of eating sea urchin guts might be a little, well, stomach churning. Yet it just goes to show how subjective the concept of gross can be when it comes to food. The Aztecs had a unique spin on chocolate that's far removed from the sweet treat we're familiar with today. Instead of sugar and milk, Aztec chocolate was a spicy, frothy beverage made from cacao beans, vanilla, and chili peppers, often consumed during religious ceremonies and as a part of noble feasts. It was so highly valued that cacao beans were used as a form of currency. However, to many modern palates, the combination of bitterness and spice might be somewhat less than delectable. Yet this wasn't the only food from the Aztec civilization that might cause a modern eater to blanch. A staple of the Aztec diet was insects, particularly the Exia cattle or waterfly. 
These aquatic insects were gathered from the surface of lakes and ponds and were considered a high-protein delicacy often eaten in tacos. For those of us accustomed to a bug-free diet, the thought of munching on a waterfly taco might not be particularly appetizing. But as with the Aztec chocolate, it highlights how varied and diverse historical diets can be. Haggis, a dish now synonymous with Scotland, has been a staple of the Scottish diet for centuries. Traditionally, this dish is prepared by taking a sheep's heart, lungs and liver, mincing them with onions, oatmeal and spices and then boiling the mixture inside the sheep's stomach. The result is a hearty, savoury dish that many outsiders find a bit challenging. Haggis's origins date back to at least the 15th century and it remains a staple of Scottish cuisine to this day. However, haggis isn't the only Scottish dish that might give modern eaters pause. Another traditional food from the same period is cruddy or crowdy cheese, a form of soft cheese that is curdled with natural lactic acid bacteria rather than rennet. This cheese dates back to the Viking era, around the 8th to 12th centuries. It's made by leaving milk to naturally sour over a period of up to two days, allowing it to curdle and then slowly heating the curdled milk until it reaches the desired consistency. It's often flavoured with a variety of herbs or spices, and while many people enjoy it, the idea of intentionally souring milk may not be appetising to all palates. Snake wine, a popular beverage in Vietnam and other Southeast Asian countries, has a history dating back centuries. This curious libation is produced by infusing whole snakes in rice wine or grain alcohol. The venomous snakes used in its production when steeped in the alcohol are believed to offer various health benefits, enhancing virility and curing a range of ailments from hair loss to farsightedness. While it's true the venom is denatured by the alcohol, the sight of a coiled snake inside the wine bottle might make a few stomachs churn today. Around the same period, another peculiar dish emerged, especially during the Tet holiday, dog meat. This delicacy was historically enjoyed in the northern part of Vietnam, primarily due to the belief that it could bring good fortune. The practice, however, has been controversial and has considerably decreased in recent years due to changing attitudes towards pets and animals. That being said, snake wine and dog meat remain striking examples of Vietnam's culinary traditions, a testament to the country's unique history and cultural practices, even if they are considered gross by some modern standards. Potted meat, a practice that dates back to the medieval period in Europe, 5th to the 15th century, was a popular method for preserving meat. Essentially, the meat was cooked slowly in fat until it was tender enough to fall off the bone and then packed into pots and covered with the remaining fat. This method of sealing kept bacteria out, making it a handy way of preserving leftover meat in an era before refrigeration. While the concept of potted meat might turn some modern stomachs, it was a vital part of survival for our ancestors during harsh winters and times of scarcity. Another food item of the same era which might be considered gross today is coquentrice. A true spectacle of medieval feasting, the coquentrice was a dish made by sewing the front end of a capon or chicken to the back end of a piglet and then roasting the whole thing. The resulting dish was meant to shock and amuse the guests, not to mention the myriad flavors it offered. A typical scene at grand feasts, Carcantris offers us a glimpse into the extreme lengths medieval chefs would go to impress their guests, a tradition that often included more theatricality than actual culinary skill. From potted meat to Carcantris, the medieval era certainly had its share of unique and, by some standards, unsavory dishes. Tracing its origins back to the Ming Dynasty, 14th to 17th century AD, the century egg is a preserved food product and a delicacy in Chinese cuisine. Eggs are soaked in a mixture of clay, ash, salt, quicklime and rice hulls for several weeks to several months, transforming the egg white into a dark, translucent, jelly-like substance and the yolk into a dark green, creamy core. Although it may sound unappetizing, the century egg has an ammonia-like aroma and a unique, complex flavor profile that's appreciated by many. Another bizarre culinary practice in ancient China was the consumption of bird's nest soup. Made from the solidified saliva nests of cave swiftlets, this soup has been a prized delicacy in China for centuries, particularly during the Tang Dynasty, 618-907 AD. The nests are harvested from cave walls, then boiled down into a gelatinous soup. 
While the idea of eating bird saliva may turn some stomachs, it's said to have a subtle, slightly sweet flavor and is highly valued for its purported health benefits. As with the century eggs, bird's nest soup shows how ancient Chinese culinary traditions could elevate seemingly unappetizing ingredients into something sophisticated and cherished. This age-old love for uniquely crafted dishes underlines the rich and diverse culinary heritage that continues to make Chinese cuisine one of the most loved around the globe. The origins of surströming, a fermented herring product, can be traced back to at least the 16th century in Sweden. This food is famous, or infamous, for its remarkably strong smell, often compared to the odor of rotten eggs, vinegar, and rancid butter. It's traditionally eaten during the late summer months, especially during the fermented herring party when people gather to enjoy this acquired taste. Despite the smell, many Swedes love the strong, salty, and somewhat acidic flavor. A lesser known yet equally offbeat Swedish food is lutfisk, popular during the Christmas season. The dish has been part of Swedish cuisine since the Middle Ages, specifically in the 14th century. Lutfisk, or lye fish, is made by soaking dried white fish in a lye solution for several days to rehydrate it, then rinsing it before cooking. The end result is a gelatinous, almost jelly-like fish that's served with a variety of accompaniments like mashed peas, mustard and bacon. Some describe the taste and texture as peculiar, with a soapy or slightly caustic edge due to the lye treatment. Both surströmming and lutfisk illustrate the creativity of ancient Swedish culinary traditions, turning simple ingredients like fish into complex, uniquely flavored dishes. While not everyone's cup of tea, these dishes are a testament to the culinary heritage of Sweden, which often favors preservation techniques that extend the shelf life of food in a country with long, harsh winters. And there you have it, from Swedish surströming to Roman garum, from the century eggs of China to the potted meat of medieval times, we feasted our way through the annals of gastronomic history. Some of these foods may sound strange, unappetizing, or even gross to us, but they were everyday fare or treasured delicacies in their time. The beauty of food is that it's not just about sustenance, it's a reflection of culture, history, and tradition. So the next time you turn your nose up at a food from a different culture, remember that taste is subjective and there's a fascinating story behind every dish. And as always, thanks for watching.